You are all set. Thank you, Sabrina. Okay, I'm gonna call the, uh, oh, no, we have the Economic Community Development Committee of the Council together. That's a mouthful, but that's our new name at 7.01 p.m. And uh, roll call with us. We have Ms. Smith, Ms. Shanahan, Mr. Hubelman, Mr. Livingston, Mr. Keegan, Ms. Young, and myself, and Mr. Hubelman and myself uh, are present. So we have all our committee members here this evening, which is great and welcome and happy new year to everyone. Um, and then first up, we have public participation. Sabrina, do we have anyone signed up to speak? We do not, and I have not received anything, so we're okay. all set. Okay, all right, so we will close public participation and move on to the minutes, the approval of the minutes of December 2nd, 2021. Any corrections to those minutes before I call for a vote? Uh, yes, Chairman. Yes, Ms. Young. So on page four, <clears throat> so it just says, Ms. Young asked Mr. Kleppen for the number of the total number of contractor yards. It's just for the total number. It's in there, it's written in there tight twice. <clears throat> so if that could be corrected, that would be okay. appreciated. No problem. Any other uh, corrections to the minutes? All right, all in favor of uh, the minutes as amended, please raise your hand and signify <clears throat> yes. Looks to be unanimous, great. And let the record show Mr. Burnett is with us tonight as well. Um, okay, now moving on to new business. Uh, first item up is item 2A1, and that is uh, under transportation, mobility, and parking. We have, uh, I'm gonna, we'll just read this. Uh, item 1, 102360 Norwalk Travel Signal System Upgrade Phase 4 Easement from Housing Authority of the City of Norwalk, and that and the item is authorized Mayor Harry W. Rilling to execute an agreement on and all easement documents necessary as part of the state project 102 uh, slash 360 Norwalk traffic signal system upgrade phase four and compensate the Norwalk Housing Authority of the city of Norwalk $5,140 as fair market value for 252 square feet of easement rights to install traffic signal apparatuses over a strip of land owned by the Housing Authority of the City of Norwalk, identified and described on a map and title right of way survey, City of Norwalk map showing the easement acquired from the Housing Authority of the City of Norwalk, subject to the positive report from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Would someone like to move that? Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Uh, with us tonight, uh, we have Mr. Yosek. I believe, Mr. Yosek, you'll be speaking to this item? Uh, yes, uh, Councilman. Uh, Basically, these, this item and the next two that you will see are for a traffic signal upgrade project that's in the final stages of design to replace uh, five traffic signals throughout town. Uh, this one in particular is the one on uh, West Avenue, uh, right at Grace Baptist Church and, and, and uh, 20 West Avenue, which is the housing authority. Um, and because, of, because the sidewalk is uh, fairly narrow there, uh, we can't put the mast arm foundation in, in, in the sidewalk as we normally do. So we need some permission to install it on private property. So we don't block the sidewalk with the mast arm foundation and traffic control equipment. Okay, thank you. Mike. Anybody have any questions? Uh, just, just one, is this going to be synchronized timing? I mean, lights? Uh, these, the, this system will be adaptive traffic. So it's the same system. The, this signal is on West Avenue, so it'll tie into the uh, piece of adaptive traffic we have from North North Main Street up to uh, uh, Matthews Park. Yeah, so some, we talked about this before, then, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Who owns the uh, the property? The Housing Authority, and, and if so, did we sell that? The city sell the property to the Housing Authority at some point? I yeah, I I don't know the. The entire history of it but it, right now it's uh, you know registered as housing authority property so through the you know through the federal acquisition guidelines we have to do an appraisal and we have to uh you know offer them money it's uh federal money so it's uh you know 100 percent reimbursable from the, the the federal government so um but they are entitled to it by by the uh the uh 
federal government uh, project funding guidelines. Any other questions for Mr. Yosek? All right, seeing none. I, I think Ms. Young, has, Ms. Young has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, darling, please. Thank, thank you. Um, I guess I was looking at, at, at number one and number two, uh, both of these items. Um, so are, are they connected with the new, with, the, with those new traffic signals at all? The, you know, the, I don't know what you call them, but the, the flashing yellow pedestrian. Um, yeah, well, basically what happened there is that that signal, there, there used to be traffic signal there uh, uh, up until about three years ago or two, two and a half, three years ago, it, it was knocked down uh, and at the time wasn't replaced, uh, but we knew a lot of pedestrians had to cross the street there to catch buses and everything. So we temporarily put up those uh, RRFB signals, but they don't really, uh, we wanna get the traffic signal back there. So so those will come down and, and this will be a, a you know true traffic signal with pedestrian uh, crossings. That, that, will, that will be red, that will indicate that people must stop at the right. crosswalk. It, yes, it'll be it'll be it'll be a red light for the West okay. Avenue traffic. Yes. Great. And 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 I and I'm I'm glad to hear that because I'll have to tell you about a month ago I actually had to wave people down to stop to let a senior citizen cross that street. So this is long overdue. So yeah, I, 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 I you know people should stop at those but for some reason, a lot of them don't want to stop at that one on West Avenue, even yep. no matter how visible we try to make it. It's just. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Mike, did you yeah. want to explain how this is phase four of a phased project, which is probably why the uh, committee has heard about it before, but that this would be the final phase in the work that we're doing with the adaptive signals? Uh, yeah, uh, well, actually, we, we have a grant application for, for another phase to upgrade another set of signals, but we haven't heard back on that yet. But basically, uh, these are CMAC funded grants that come up like about every three years, and we apply for them. And we've been basically upgrading our traffic signals throughout the city for uh, probably like the last 12 years. So this is the this is a fourth grant that we received, and that's the reason it's uh, uh, phase four. And I do have another question, Chairman. So I know that there was um, one of those traffic signal lights on Flax Hill, but I don't recall seeing them. Do you have they been removed? Has that uh, that yellow flashing um, crosswalk? That's, uh, that's still there. Okay. I think there's two. I believe there's two on Flax Hill. Uh, I, and and the one I'm talking about is at the intersection of Flax Hill and Low Street. Okay, yeah, there's one at Flax Hill and Low and one at Flax Hill and Clay, I believe. Okay. That's and, it. Thanks. Yeah, and we have several of them at other places in town where they usually work, but this one on West Avenue for this. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand and say goodbye, yes. Yes. All right, unanimous, great. All right, moving on. Um, item 2A2, uh, 102 360 North Traffic, traffic Signal System Upgrade Phase 4 easement from Grace Baptist Church. Authorize Mayor Harry W. Rowan to execute any and all easement documents necessary as part of the state project 102 360 Norwalk Traffic Signal System Upgrade Phase 4 and compensate Grace Baptist Church $1,930 as fair value for. 48 square feet of easement rights to install a traffic signal apparatus over a strip of land owned by Grace Baptist Church and identifying and describing the map inside a right of way survey, city of Norwalk map showing easement acquired from Grace Baptist Church by the city of Norwalk, subject to a positive report by from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Someone like to move this item. Thank you, Lisa, Ms. Ms. Shanahan. Um, Mike, please. Um, can you give us a little information about this, please? Sure. This is this is the uh, uh, basically the same item as the, uh, the the previous one. It's uh, 
across the street on the other side for, for another Mast Arm Foundation, again, because the sidewalk is a little bit too narrow. So we're putting the Mast Arm Foundation on the property and uh, we, for, that, for that we need the easement. Any questions? Okay. All in favor? Darlene, yes. Okay. Yes. It looks looks to be unanimous. Thank you. All right. Item two a three. Pretty much a lot of the same language. One hundred two three sixty North traffic signal systems upgrade phase four easements from. Riverview East Condominium authorized, authorized Mayor Harry W. Reeling to execute any and all easement documents necessary as part of the State Project 102360 North Traffic Signal System Upgrade Phase 4 and compensate Riverview East Condominium for an amount of $3,210 as fair market value for 190 square feet of easement rights to install traffic signal apparatuses over a strip of land owned by River. View East Condominium identified and described on the map entitled Right of Way Survey City of Norwalk map showing easement acquired from Riverview East Condominium by the City of Norwalk subject to a positive report from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Would someone like to move this item? Thank you, Ms. Smith. Okay, Mike. Uh, again, we're replacing the traffic signal at East Avenue at Eversley. And as part of the project, we need to put a, another master arm foundation in there. And uh, again, because we don't have the width in the sidewalk, we need an easement off of the um, Riverside East Condo Association to, to, to put that master arm in and complete that signal. And, and basically with this third easement in place, uh, we'll be able to advertise this uh, project for bid and replace uh, five signals in, in, in the city, so, which is the one at Grace Baptist Church, this one here at Eversley, the East Avenue at St. John's, um, West Avenue at Garner, and uh, Newtown at Allen Road. Mike, when do you think they'll be done? Uh, we have the final design plans up there being, being reviewed. We, we, we uh, we should have the last of the comments back this week. Uh, our consultant will address them rather quickly. So we're looking to advertise this in in, in April or May and, and, and probably start construction um, in August and, and, and complete it. Um, hopefully, maybe the end of this year, if we can, if, if, we, if the steel comes in on time. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, that was moved. All in favor? And uh, unanimous. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. You have a good night. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Item B1, update on the Norwalk River Valley Trail and Harbor Loop planning effort. Uh, we have Mr. Bedoli with us. Hey, Brian, I believe you're going to be giving us this update. Yeah. How, how you doing? Good. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for inviting me uh, to present on the trail today. I'm going to just kind of give a brief update of a project that uh, I know a number of you have been involved with, uh, looking at the Norwalk River Valley Trail, specifically the Harbor Loop Trail, and a few sections that we've initiated design work on. Um, can you all see my screen okay? You good? All right. Good deal. So um, it's really a targeted effort. We're taking a look at three very specific sections, which you're seeing here on the screen is sort of the overall Harbor Loop network as it interfaces with the Norwalk River Valley Trail. But we're primarily focused here on uh, Sono Wharf, uh, taking a look at the existing parking lot and the potential for increasing its presence as a park. Um, also, you know, replacing and accommodating the parking needs uh, with the IMAX theater being uh, demolished and the plans for that space moving forward. Also looking on the east side of the river at 148 East uh, Ave and 130 East Ave to sort of identify and design critical connections of the trail to sort of make that a full a full loop. And that would also interface with the Yankee Doodle piece that we've been, that is also concurrently being designed with Mike Yosek and the DOT as part of the bridge project over there. Um, so really we're just in the initial stages. Uh, we've started some initial community outreach. 
Uh, we've had a number of focus groups. We've been meeting with the uh, local property owners. And one of the key things that we've, we've done is actually met with DEEP. A lot of this, you know, as it goes through environmentally sensitive property, uh, there's going to be a number of sort of rest uh, restrictions that we have to follow and that will influence the overall design. So we're sort of threading a needle in, in some ways in terms of what we can and can't do based on the various permits that are going to be required. But we have had positive meetings with DEEP. Um, they are open to the concept, but obviously it's just going to require further investigation, which we are um, embark we are currently involved with. So I'm happy to answer any questions. It's really just more of an introductory to what we're doing and kind of where we're going. Tom? Yeah, hey, Brian, so did you, did you ever get in touch with the people at 148? Yep, we just met with them this week. Good, because I actually spoke to my one of my doctors there who was reaching out to the managing partner there. So good, I'm glad you heard back. So. Yep, that worked out. Good, thanks. Were they, I'm sorry, were they receptive? What's that? Yeah, they were receptive. They, you know, some of their concerns were just for, uh, based around the parking and it becoming an access point and they already stretched with parking. So I think that's just going to help us design it so that we can make sure that there's separate uses um, and there's some sort of, you know, separation between the two so that it doesn't overwhelm their parking demand. Yeah, for what it's worth, my doctor was very enthusiastic about it. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. You know, part of this too is, you know, getting ready for some of the infrastructure funds that we expect and wanting to have designs in hand. So that's really what we're focused on. To obtain funding for it moving forward. Brian, has there been any contact with 130? Do we have any information about how they're doing about this? Yeah, we're still working on that. Um, what we've decided to do is we're putting together sort of an introductory email presentation with a list of questions and hopefully we'll get some response that way. They seem to be the real problem, right? Yeah, they've been difficult to um, get in touch with. Hey, Brian, what's the what's the time frame on having the designs on this? Yeah, so we're hoping to have the full design plans by May is the sort of end target date. Um, what we're doing right now is we, we went through an initial round of stakeholder engagement focus groups, meeting with DEEP, and we're actually going to have some preliminary designs to discuss probably towards the end of this month and then tee up for a larger public engagement meeting. There's sort of This is sort of the tale of two projects. We have a relatively straightforward design discussion apart from some of the property owner constraints on the east side. Um, the alignment is sort of set and, and dictated by the environmental conditions and property ownership. Um, the Sona Wharf, I think there's gonna be an opportunity for a larger discussion um, that will will be coming out and probably towards the end of January with a, a public meeting uh, with some preliminary designs to, to, for you all to react to, for us to discuss. And then from there, we'll work towards that May date. Great, thanks. Yep. Yeah, Brian, I know you put you and your staff are putting a lot of work into this, and I thank you for that. Of course, no problem. All right. Yeah, just a, just a comment. Um, this is really exciting. I, I did um, join in that uh, presentation last week or the week before. Yeah, it's really exciting uh, that we're at this point, and um, I'm hopeful that you hear from 130 East Avenue soon. Yeah, we'll and to that point, Brian, if you do, if you own property owner that doesn't sign up, how does, I mean, how does that affect the this project? Well, I mean, I think you just look. You we're obviously going to look at alternatives as well. You know, there's the on road sections that you could look at. Um, you know, obviously with private property, there's a number of things, a number of considerations that need to be given. Um, but we could look for other options. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brian. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay, um, moving on to item C under economic community development, business development, and tourism. Item one is authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rowling, to execute an agreement between the city of Norwalk and the Connecticut Department of Housing and Economic Development to receive a $3 million in Urban Act program funding related to the MLK corridor initiative. Uh, Jessica, will you be speaking to this? I'd like to move the item. Oh, thank you, Darlene. Let the record show Darlene has moved the item. Yes, I'll be speaking to it. Great. So we have a presentation um, to give to the committee tonight regarding the MLK Corridor Initiative. Just going to jump right in.
the slide will change. So we want to cover a number of um, different slides with you this evening, and the objective is to be able to outline what the MLK corridor project is, um, how long we've been meeting, and what the timelines have been, how we've identified priorities, and then the priorities that uh, we would like to fund with the $3 million that is being received by um, the city through the DCD Urban Act program. So for those um, who are unfamiliar with the MLK Corridor Initiative, uh, in 2017, legislation was filed um, to create the MLK Corridor Initiative. At that point in time, the legislation was passed and the Department of Revenue and Commerce put out an RFP that asked um, different organizations to apply to uh, identify different MLK Corridor Initiatives with um, three different objectives. One was economic development, one was housing, and the other was education. And the idea would be to um, identify MLK corridors, geographic um, distinctions in certain municipalities, and then be able to set up programming and pr identify priorities in order to address um, some of the needs in those particular communities. And so um, the successful recipient of $150,000 was Freedom Faith Collaborative, and they had identified three separate municipalities. One was Norwalk, one Middletown, and the second and the third was New Britain. Um, and so this is how the whole MLK Corridor Initiative started here in Norwalk. <clears throat> that was in 2017. And in 2019, we actually brought a number of different community members together um, to be able to create the MLK Corridor Initiative here in Norwalk. We worked with them to create a geography, um, and we also worked with them to then uh, hold two community meetings in October 2019, where we had over 50 attendees and got over 100 comments um, on a specific geography, which I will show you, um, and basically started to put together priority lists for the actual community and understanding um, what they wanted and how they wanted it. And what was interesting is that we actually ended up coming up with um, more than 75 different goals and objectives that equaled more than $7.3 million in total for the South Norwalk geography. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but it was a very fruitful exercise as far as being able to reach out to the community and understand priorities and objectives. We did actually launch a couple of initiatives already through the MLK Corridor Initiative in November, 2020. The Redevelopment Agency launched the MLK Facade Program, and it was a facade program that funded $280,000 worth of facade improvements. Uh, a little bit different than some of the other programs that had been offered before because it was specific to the MLK geography. But in addition to that, it was also geared at homeowners and renters, which was something that we had not done before. And it was also geared at not only historical homes, but homes that were not historical, which is something that we had also not done before. In April 2021, we worked with Senator Duff to be able to submit on the Bond Commission bill, and the Bond Commission approved a $3 million grant for the MLK Corridor Initiative through the Urban Act Program, uh, which is administered through DECD. So at that point in time, um, of course, as you can see on the time when we also launched the MLK uh, Art Initiative, which was a $50,000 initiative uh, led by the Arts Commission. And Sabrina had a huge hand in that in leading that from a city standpoint. So I wanna congratulate her on her good work. Um, but you had heard about that over a number of different meetings just a little while ago with Warren Clayton um, and approving her, uh, uh, the contract in which we were able to give her funds to be able to complete the Clay Street uh, staircase and also the, the pump station um, mural. So those were completed. But after we received the bond commission approval for 3 million, we brought the MLK corridor initiative together and we split off into different subcommittees to be able to really identify the projects that we wanted to move forward with. And that's where I mentioned that we came up with the list of 75 things worth $7.3 million knowing that we only had $3 million to really move forward. Um, what was great about that project is that not only did we identify the goals and objectives in total, which was really helpful considering um, the different funding sources that the city has now seen come through, 
but we also were able to prioritize each of those lists. So uh, for example, we identified a number of different um, traffic, mobility, and connectivity improvements, but we were able to work with the different MLK corridor initiative members to be able to then number those one through 12, for example, to be able to understand sort of what we wanted to fund right off the bat and what we thought was something that could wait a little bit longer. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that the, um, with the ARPA funds coming in and also the GGP funds through the SONO collection, um, we really, even though we only have 3 million in the Urban Act program, we've been able to fund almost 90% of the priorities and goals that were identified through the group. So the timing of the funding that has come through has been really helpful in the sense of being able to understand what the criteria for each funding source is and then being able to work with the community and work with um, different folks to be able to understand how to fund as much as possible um, in the geography and also across the city. So where we are today is where the orange uh, arrow is, uh, January 4th. So we're bringing um, the resolution to you today for a vote uh, in hopes to be able to, um, hey, it's not January 4th, it's January 6th. Um, the arrow should be one to the <laughs> one to the right. I apologize for that. Um, January the sixth, so economic community development uh, committee meeting, and and hopes to be able to bring it to the common council on Tuesday for uh, a vote by common council, so that we are able to then execute the agreement with DCB to be able to bring the funds into the city and be able to move forward on some of this work. So for those who are not familiar with the MLK uh, corridor geography, wanted to be able to put up this map just as a reference point to you. Um, it goes from the mall on the north side to uh, all the way down um, to really the industrial area past the Sono Ice House. Um, and it connects really the residential areas on the left side of MLK and the right side of MLK. Uh, it's really quite extensive and I think this is an important map because sometimes when we think of the MLK corridor, we think of just the actual MLK, MLK road itself, but in reality, this geography is actually quite extensive. So when we identified the priorities with um, the MLK corridor initiative, there were definitely um, four very strong uh, focus areas that came out. And one of them was housing improvements. The second was traffic mobility and connectivity. Third was green space and park improvements. And a fourth was neighborhood safety and beautification improvements. And as I said, um, we did split up into subcommittees, which is, um, which is actually falling into these four categories themselves. And then we were able to organize the goals and priorities identified within each one for the funding streams. So, to get into it right off the bat, um, we really wanted to focus on the MLK facade improvement program. And this basically is an extension of a pre-existing program. It's the program that I spoke about um, in the timeline in November, 2020, when we launched $280,000 to improve 13 um, homes. And you know, the redevelopment agency led this effort. They did a really great job. They actually went door to door and handed out uh, pamphlets. And we had twice as many applicants um, to the program that we had ever had before going through that, those efforts. So not only did we work with the folks on the committee, we worked with the faith-based community, and then we went door to door and, and to ensure that everyone knew that the program was happening um, and that everyone had an equitable chance to be able to apply. With the 750,000, um, we're looking to administer that over a number of different years to be able to, again, uh, support owner-occupied and renter-occupied uh, dwellings that will focus on um, facade improvements, which can be structural or could be aesthetic. So it just depends on how that works. Normally, the way that it works is that the application comes into the redevelopment agency. The redevelopment agency meets with the applicant reviews the project. Um, we work with contractors to be able to price out the work. Um, and the way that we've done it before is that we capped it at 25,000 per unit or $100,000 per building. But that's something that I think that we want to explore a little bit differently. Um, it might be a good opportunity with the 750,000 to explore some of the multifamily units that are in South Norwalk that are in the MLK geography and, try, and um, being able to support some of the improvements there. 
So there are also um, improvements for traffic mobility and connectivity. And as you can see here, um, there's a list of a few of them we can walk through. So um, as you probably know, the MLK staircase at Clay was uh, torn apart and put back in a couple of years ago. Um, it was a great project because it actually um, included heating devices throughout the staircase so that the snow would not collect. We also improved lighting um, and we also improved pedestrian safety there. So um, at that point in time, we had actually had money in the capital budget for the staircase at Hamilton. But when we put out the bids for the staircase at Hamilton, the bids came in more money than what we actually had in the capital budget. So it's been sitting in the capital budget for probably about three or four years at this point. And this is a really good source um, to be able to fund the reconstruction of that staircase in the same way in which we did the clay staircase. But it's really important to have the connectivity between each of the staircases and the, and the Sono train station. So we're looking at spending funding um, to put in high-vis crosswalks, which is not um, like what you just heard Mike Yosik talk about for West Avenue as well. Um, we're talking about high-vis crosswalks at Washington and MLK, and the four there means that it would be all four legs of the intersection. Um, the high-vis crosswalk at Couch and MLK, which is where the daycare is located, um, where, which we think you know, is really important to be able to get people back and forth. We're looking at sidewalk installation repair for 400,000. That would be focused on areas that are farther within the MLK corridor initiative, not around where the current development is happening. And then we also have talked about four bus shelters um, and we would focus those bus shelters on high ridership routes where the sidewalk clearance would allow for those bus shelters to be installed. But as you can see with the mobility and traffic and connectivity, we're focusing on one, safety, um, and two, really making sure that we're thinking about first and last mile and supporting the neighborhood and being able to get to school, get to work, um, and do that in a really safe manner. From green space and park improvements, um, we're looking at two investments. One is a tree planting program, various locations. So we worked really closely with DPW, um, Anthony Carr, Chris Torrey, and also Paul Sotnik to be able to understand what they had looked at in the geography for tree planting um, and what was possible. And we had identified probably 10 different locations for trees, including um, school grounds, including park areas, but also a large number of corridors that could really use um, greening up. This actually would allow us to um, plant and have a stretch goal of 200 trees for the geography. And we're pretty confident that we can use the DPW contract to be able to um, be able to plant these trees. Uh, we'll work with private property owners as well in order to plant trees. So really excited about that initiative. And the second here is the playground improvement. So there are two parks that were identified through the MLK Corridor Initiative members. Um, one is Bolton and one is Meadow Street. Um, the Bolton has two playgrounds. One playground was actually um, reconstructed in 2016, but the second playground is older. So there's funding that would be put to the second playground so that we can reconstruct that. And then Meadow Street, um, as you know, Meadow Street Playground could just use a little bit of attention um, I think that we need to go in there and be able to reconfigure and redesign um, the playground there. And given its location and its proximity to the residential neighborhood, I think it's really important to be able to do that. So they were two initiatives that were identified by the group. And then lastly, um, this is our last focus area, neighborhood safety and beautification improvements. So again, two priorities here. One is the public art initiative. We know that $50,000, um, we were able to have the clay um, staircase uh, mural and also the pump station mural. So we think that we'll be able to get two, potentially two more murals out of um, this public art initiative money or potentially something else that would fit under the public art definition. And we'll work with the art and um, commission to be able to do that. But we definitely wanted to be able to put some funds to enhancing the um, main corridor area. The other thing that I wanted to mention here is that each of these initiatives 
um, really has a partner or was married with one of the other funding sources that we are, that the city is receiving. And what I mean by that is that we originally wanted to do traffic boxes, 10 traffic boxes for $10,000 um, to not only paint new boxes, but also to repaint some of the boxes that have been flaking over time. And we were able to do that, but we used a different funding source to be able to do that. So it's been really great to be able to think about the overlay of the MLK corridor initiative um, and the city work with the different funding sources that are all coming together in different ways. So even though we're presenting this list, um, there's also other initiatives that are gonna go on that will be complementary to the area. And the last one here is cameras and cleanup. So um, we've been, we actually did a cleanup in Whistleville probably about a month ago or a month and a half ago. And we picked up over a thousand pounds of garbage in that one, um, in that one day out. So one of the things that we wanna do is install cameras um, and really support the community cleanups, specifically um, Bell Ave, Crescent Street, Gray Rock Road and Ingalls Ave. Um, the way that we prioritize this is that Bell, Crescent, and Gray Rock Roads are all new telephone poles. So we have access, um, fairly good access and a fairly good partnership to be able to work with them, to be able to install the lights. Ingalls is going to take a little bit more work. It's Eversource. So we're gonna have to work with them to be able to access the poles. But these are all areas where we've seen um, habitual dumping and not dumping that is just garbage dumping, but mattresses, appliances, paint cans, things that are very large and um, very large and very invasive in nature. So David Shockley and the Neighborhood Improvement Group are going to be working to lead that. But other things that came up in the MLK Corridor Initiative Committee um, that where we wanted to do funding and we wanted to look at ways in which we could make investment into the neighborhood are actually still being addressed. And that's why I was saying that even though we have $7 million worth of asks, $7.3 million of asks and 3 million for the Urban um, Act program don't cover it, we still have um, ARPA and we have the GGP funds to be able to address some of these initiatives. One of them is the MLK loan program. Um, and this is a really important one that we talked about. It actually will be administered by the redevelopment agency um, and we're looking at revolving loans. So if someone um, needs a new boiler, someone needs new heating system, someone needs new um, electrical system and there's a health and safety issue, we have the ability, the redevelopment agency will have the ability to be able to actually lend out the $500,000 and then administer the, the loan over time. Uh, we just feel like this is a huge uh, step forward for the city of Norwalk. It's not something that we've done before. Um, and so we're really excited about it and something that the MLK Corridor Initiative Committee felt very, very strongly about. Um, the next two are actually items that are funded through what you just heard about, which is uh, different grants that we had already received. So you heard about the Grace Baptist and you heard about some other crosswalks along West Ave, um, which is why we wanted to include them in the we wanted to include them in the MLK corridor initiative, but we also wanted to flag that we didn't need to use the three million to be able to cover the costs. Um, as you know, nonprofit organization funding through community services through ARPA is four million dollars, which we think will um, be very beneficial to this neighborhood and business funding, which you'll hear about next, um, especially women, minority, and business-owned um, entities. We're looking at uh, $2.93 million of ARPA funding towards those entities. From a mobility standpoint, we're looking at spending a million dollars of ARPA funding, which we think, um, of course, we already talked about the 400,000, but we think that the 1 million will also be beneficial to the neighborhood. And then of course, last but definitely, definitely not least, um, we've been talking about an affordable housing plan and being able to fund that through ARPA. So $120,000 through the ARPA money. Um, and we've been talking with planning and zoning who will lead that effort um, kicking it off in the fall. So that would be bringing on a consultant and a vendor to be able to understand all of the data that we have in house, understand the data gaps that we have, help us consolidate the information and be able to make recommendations on what type of housing and where that housing should be located. And I think that's a really important plan for the city of Norwalk moving forward. 
So of course, the arrow should be one to the right because <laughs> we're on January 6th. But really where that puts us is that, um, uh, you know, dependent on your vote this evening, we'd like to go to Common Council on January the 11th, which is Tuesday. And then we would contract with DCD to bring in the $3 million of funding. And then between 2022 and 2023, that's when we would actually see contracting with the vendors and the actual construction of these projects. And so um, with that, we're asking for you to vote on a resolution to be able to have the mayor sign the agreement for the Urban Act program, um, which we, we then be able to support all of the initiatives that I had just covered. Thanks, Jess. That was very informative. Any questions? Okay. Chairman, uh, no questions. Um, just a comment, um, just to really say um, how much I appreciate uh, 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 Jessica and and um, the redevelopment agency. I don't know if Brian is still on board um, and and everyone else's effort and and really. Um, sticking with this, because um, as Jessica mentioned, this has been going on since 2017 and it was a lot of commitment from, from the community um, to ensure that this, this moved forward in this way. And I think, you know, timing has been everything, you know, with the influx of funding from the state, with the GGP money, and then the ARPA funds, it's really allowed us to put together a really robust um, and impactful initiative for the South Norwalk community. So um, I appreciate uh, all the hard work of everybody involved. So thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I echo that. You could obviously see a lot of work went into this and a lot of good's gonna come out of it. And I know and, Sue, and Darlene T, I know you've been involved in this for a long time as well. So thank, thank you as well. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add? Oh, Mr. Livingston. I think Mr. I'm Greg sorry, has his hand up, John. Oh. I think I think Greg was first. Um, Greg, Mr. Burnett, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to echo the comments from uh, Darlene. Uh, I've been on several meetings with Jessica and uh, an enormous amount of work in terms of um, utilizing these funds in a very transformative way. Um, uh, as we begin to actually do work in the uh, MLK corridor, um, um, so this this going to be activity that will uh, people will look at it and say, "Well, I did this just didn't look like this a few years ago." Um, so it, it's an opportunity to transform the entire area, and um, I'm uh, thankful for Jessica and her team for making it happen. Tom? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to also add that, you know, as people have come and Jessica and her team and, and have been really been remarkable in this most, well, the thing that really sticks out to me along with all the work is how she was able to find alternative funding sources for so many different things, be it ARPA, be it the MLK funds, be it the, the um, mall funds, loosely spe speaking. Um, just that the way you were able to look at all the different resources available to try and fund as much as you can. I really commend you for all the hard work in doing that. So thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, do you mind, Jessica, uh, stop sharing your screen so I can see the vote? Great, thank you. Um, the item was moved by Ms. Young. All in favor, please raise your hand and signify yes. Unanimous, great. Okay, uh, next up, um, item C2, information and update for the ARPA funding for business support. Yeah, let's see. Sorry for all the slides tonight, everybody. The easiest way, I think, to be able to communicate all the things that we've been talking about. There we go. So this one we got right, it's January the 6th, and here we are to talk about um, the ARPA funds. Let me just, thank you guys, there we go. 
So again, just a lot to talk about when it comes to ARPA funds, and I'm just going to get right into it. Um, and this is from, these couple slides are from the presentation that you saw um, at Common Council meeting in October, I believe it was October the 12th. But just as a reminder for you, um, one of the things that we did when we were looking at the ARPA funds is that we looked at all of the different studies and all the different plans that had been done over the last number of years and the priorities and the goals that had come out and the recommendations that had come out from each of the different areas and groups that we had focused on. And the thought was that um, we had spent city time and we had asked the residents to participate and the residents did participate. They participated in many um, different uh, avenues to be able to provide feedback <clears throat> and comments on what they wanted and how they wanted it. And it was a great opportunity for us to be able to identify all of the needs and wants of the community um, based on the residential feedback and be able to really focus the ARPA funds on being able to be responsive to that. And when we started to pull out all the information um, from all of the different reports that we had completed, again, we started to see these common themes um, and started to hear common uh, commonalities in the way in which the funding um, should be spent and ways in which we could spend the funding. But what was most interesting is that, again, we had over 150 um, different projects and initiatives that we had identified and being able to use ARPA and the MLK funding and the funding from the mall, we had this huge opportunity to be able to um, combine the resources and be able to fund over 90% of the different um, initiatives and projects that had been identified, which I think is just a huge uh, opportunity for the city. And I don't know one that we will probably ever see again. So it's really important um, that we leverage the funds in the most meaningful way as we can. Um, we're really pleased with economic and community development ARPA funds because of the 39.3 million, 6 million or 15% were dedicated to economic community development efforts. And when we looked at that along with the 3 million, and along with the 3.5 um, million from the GGP, uh, we really started to be able to see how the puzzle could fit together and how our funding sources could be used in a really meaningful way. I think um, I really appreciate the comments that you made on uh, us creatively looking at which pots could fund which projects because each of the different funding pots has different criteria and different eligibility. So part of trying to make the projects work and be able to make the funding work um, was dependent on how the grants were written or how the programs were written in which we got the funding for. But just as a reminder to everybody the ARPA funds have, do have a timeline. Um, the funds need to be appropriated by December the 31st, 2024. So keeping in mind um, as we walk through this presentation. So uh, we didn't want to completely overwhelm you at this meeting by talking about all of the ways in which we would like to be able to spend the ARPA funds. So this meeting, we're gonna talk about business support and modernization in support of business. But then next month in February, we'll talk about housing, environmental green space and walkability mobility. But the way, um, in which we see the economic community development ARPA priorities fitting in based on, again, what common themes we heard from all of the different outreach that we have done. Um, they really fit into these specific categories uh, and, uh, and we feel really strongly about them. So what I'm gonna to present to you this evening is $2.93 million in business support funding through ARPA. Um, the way in which we see these is almost two different kind of columns the way that I've presented it here for you. One is business support, which is um, existing business support, women minority business support, incremental business support, and public and oh, excuse me, public space programming. Um, the other side of the house is more modernization and support business. So um, what this means is techno adopting technological enhancements or being able to look at our work processes or being able to adopt certain ways to be able to do the work in-house that make us more business friendly and actually support businesses getting through the process and support residents and being able to apply for permits and licenses as well. So the one on the left is more um, direct grants and loans to business. The one on the right is more internal processes 
that we'll be uh, enhancing to be able to be more business friendly. So getting right into it, um, it's a lot of information, but we wanted to share with you our thinking about the business COVID assistance, which is really the first bucket that we had talked about. Um, this would be direct grant funding to 101 different businesses. We're looking at dedicating $745,000 to be able to fund the 101 businesses. We would look to divide that out between 2022, 2023, and 2024. And the way in which we're thinking about it is that we would give awards to um, uh, businesses with employees two to five people, businesses six to 15 people, and businesses 16 to 20 people. And the grant amount would depend on the size of the business itself. I think it's really important to um, point out a couple things. One is that this is actually um, a revised version of what we had done in phase one in 2020 when we gave $5,000 grants to over 30 businesses through the lottery system. And we did that when we took $75,000 from contingency and we matched that with $75,000 from the Main Street Small Business Program. Um, but it's really important to note that we want over one third of those businesses were actually women minority uh, business entities. And the other thing that's important to note is that even though we we're able to give 30 grants of $5,000 each, we had two or over 200 businesses that actually applied for that money. So there's clearly a need out there. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we would administer the funding. One, uh, the business must demonstrate financial loss. And that was something that we had done with the first round as well. They must have funding eligibility. Um, businesses that didn't receive funding in phase one are those that will be eligible. And the businesses have to have no violations, no zoning violations, um, no other violations, and they need to be paid up on their taxes. We don't want to be giving funds to businesses to be able to pay um, taxes that are um, back taxes. So again, we'll be doing it through a lottery system. Um, we did that the same with phase one, and we're looking to be able to um, release the applications in March and then make the grants in May. And I think it's really important to note that we uh, want to make a commitment to the women, minority business entities and enterprises. So we're looking at a 35, 34% match of $250,000 here. Are there any questions? move on. So this is something that's also really exciting. Um, all of these, all of these are super, just, all of these are absolutely fantastic. And we're just really, really excited about this. And I should say that um, Sabrina Church, who's on, who's our business development tourism director, has done a ton of work on being able to shape these programs as well. So just really want to give kudos to her to being able to be responsive to um, the business owners out there they're looking for support, but in addition, working with our partners, um, working with the redevelopment agency, working with the Chamber of Commerce and so on and so forth. So this is something that we've never really done before. It's not something we've seen before and um, really excited about it. We're gonna be partnering with the redevelopment agency and partnering with the Chamber of Commerce to actually provide a physical location for businesses to receive assistance and support in the form of direct loans and training. And that storefront will be in the Wall Street West Ave area. Um, and we're looking to fund through ARPA, the support and the administration, the operations of this program between 2022 and 2024. And there's a few different pieces to um, this particular uh, initiative. And one of them is the um, one of them is the effort that you had voted on last month, which is the Kiva partnership. So as you know, through that effort, we're going to have a capital access manager who's going to be working directly with small businesses and different business entities and different prospective businesses to be able to offer them loans between $1,000 and $15,000. Um, and we would like that capital access manager to be able to sit on site in this particular business development center. Um, the second piece is that we'd like to be able to use $247,500 in ARPA funds to be able to provide 33 businesses that are women minority um, business entities uh, with funding, with source seed funding. So that would be a match program. We would match dollar for dollar if they were to go for a $7,500 um, loan through 
If they were to go for a $15,000 loan through Kiva, they would need to raise $7,500 on their own, and then we would match the $7,500. The great thing about this is that um, when our relationship ends with Kiva, the contract is a three-year contract. Um, the funds would actually be returned back to the city. So they're not revolving funds that stay in the Kiva system. They're actually funds that come back, um, that actually come back to the city. The one thing that we do want to make sure, and I want to be completely transparent about this, is that we're just double checking that the ARPA funds um, can actually be used as revolving funds and they can be brought back into the city given the timeline that we need to spend them by. So this is one thing that we're proposing for ARPA, but we may need to be a little bit flexible in the way in our funding source for this particular item, only in the sense that we need to draw down those funds by December 2024. And then lastly, we've been working with the chamber and working with the redevelopment agency to do two separate things. One is through SCORE, having SCORE sit at the physical location and offer technical assistance um, from previous business owners who have gone through these processes before to be able to help business get up and running. Um, and second of all, the redevelopment agency will also be offering technical assistance and technical skill set training for uh, extremely low and low income households and those folks that want to start businesses as well. So, you know, it's just something that we're really excited about, it's something that I don't think that we've ever really been able to do. Um, we know that Open Doors is doing efforts. We know the Chamber of Commerce has efforts. We know the redevelopment agency has efforts. And and we have efforts and they're all going on. So in this particular project and initiative, the goal was really to be able to consolidate all of the different trainings and skill set workshops that are going on across the city by all of the different partners and bring them together in one space so that we can offer them to the residents of Norwalk. Good. Can I move on or would you any questions? Yes, uh, David Huvelin. Hey, um, I'm very excited by this. I love the idea of a, of an actual physical location for people to be able to go to uh, that this would uh, these programs would come out of. And I know last month when we when we went through the Kiva stuff, I just this just sort of builds on that and that that expansion of our ability to help small business in Norwalk. And I, I'm very excited by this. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. So this is Jeff, the Norwalk Jeff, this, Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Jeff. This is yeah. Tom. I have, I have a question. A yeah, of course. So you indicated that uh, we gave out some grants in 2020. Mm-hmm. Do we know how many of those businesses are still operating? I don't know. Um, I don't know off the bat, but it's something we can follow up with this group on. I'm not sure. Sabrina, do you know offhand? I don't know the exact number offhand, but there are some that have closed. I know that for a fact. Um, I just don't know how many of them, but it's not a majority of them. It's probably one or two, but I'll check and get back. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. I, 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 I have a, 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 just a comment too. I, and I think um, just based on what Councilman Ke uh, Keegan just asked, you know, given COVID as well. Um, so it, it's hard, you know, a lot of existing businesses are having a difficult time. And so, um, you know, it just seems like some form of something will be impacting businesses moving forward. And I guess, I don't know, you know, maybe we've been thinking about um, continued support because I think it is kind of tough to have a business start up in such uncertainty, uncertain times, and then unfortunately not be able to sustain themselves. Um, so just, you know, thinking how do we, you know, what's plan B, what kind of safety nets um, can we put in place you know, to kind of help people, you know, in, in those instances so that they're not starting a business and then not able to sustain it. Um, I'm sure you guys have been thinking about that, but I think just as we move forward, that should definitely be part of the conversation and the, the process, really. Yeah, I totally agree. And it is definitely something that we've talked about. We've talked about the struggle of 
do you give um, larger grants to a smaller number of businesses or do you give a smaller number of grants to a larger number of businesses and how do you ensure that the businesses are getting what they need to be able to sustain themselves and be successful so it's um so it's just it's been a you know to be perfectly clear it's been a struggle of a conversation because we think that we don't know that there's a right or a wrong right we just know that there are a lot of folks um, and a lot of businesses that need a lot of support and what we were trying to do with this and also the COVID business assistance was help as many businesses as we could in a different scaled approach based on the number of employees, um, but then also make sure that that funding stretched across 2022, 2023, and 2024 as well, um, because we know that we're still in COVID, so we don't really want to expend all of the funding in year one and then not be able to follow up with any of that safety net funding that you're talking about, Darlene. Right. And 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 so you know, for business that unfortunately, you know, doesn't make it, are they, would they have the capability to come back and participate in any one of these programs? Um, do we look at them differently? How, how would that work? So I think the, um, so I think if the way that the COVID assistance program works, this one here is that if you've received funding once, you've sort of you've expended your application load for this particular program. Okay. This, this one here, the Business Development Center, and the next one that I'll show, they're different because they are based on, um, these would be loan programs and technical assistance versus a grant program. So the loan program, the business would have to pay back over time so they could apply really, if they, if they needed to, they could apply multiple times as long as it fits within the Kiva business model. Um, and Kiva Hub is the one who would be making those, administering those loans. Um, but as far as the technical assistance goes, they would be able to go in for technical assistance through SCORE and the redevelopment agency as many times as they would want. So. The idea is not only to give them the funding through the grant, but then it's also to the, provide them with the technical assistance and the loan capability where they actually have multiple different tools that they can use to be able to get through the tough times. Darlene, I'll also mention to you that other municipalities that have been using the Kiva program, they were using that to do COVID assistance. Like we did the grants, they did the zero interest loans through Kiva instead since they didn't have the, um, the funding to do just straight up grants through the city. So that's why a lot of them actually started um, the program itself is to really be that assistance program to get through COVID for businesses. Um, so I think it pairs nicely if it was somebody, for example, who was in the lottery and ended up getting, like ended up not getting chosen, they could then, or simultaneously, they could do both. Um, apply for the Kiva program and be able to utilize the platform there to be able to get funding if they didn't get the first one. Great, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Just click off of this. So this is, um, Another initiative that we're talking about with the ARPA funds, which is the Norwalk Innovation Program. And the Norwalk Innovation Program is, again, um, something that we're looking to be able to offer as a tool to businesses that want to get off the ground. And this is some seed funding for startups and entrepreneurs. And in order to be eligible for this funding, they need to go through a training session and they need to be able to complete that training session then they need to be able to go through a Shark Tank pitch exercise. And then after that, um, successful applicants will receive a $10,000 startup grant. This is actually something that we've been doing with the, in partnership with the Chamber um, and with SCORE already. So it's actually an extension of an already existing project. Um, we ended up uh, getting capital funding last year for micro entrepreneurial program. Um, when I say last year, I mean the last um, budget cycle. So we've actually been going through 
this particular program this year, um, and Sabrina has been participating on behalf of the city. So this would actually fund 11 businesses in 2022, 2023, and 2024. And again, <clears throat> the goal here, excuse me, is to be able to ensure that the business gets the training and they complete the training before we actually give them the grant. So we want to be sure that we're putting the businesses on the best path to success. And we feel like being able to do that means that we'll be able to work with them in a meaningful way, have them go through the process, meet all of the milestones and the eligibility for being able to receive the grant. So over the last three that I've just presented, um, not only are we looking at doing grants for COVID relief, we're actually looking at doing the technical assistance and the training for the businesses to either get a loan or be able to get a grant through this particular program. Yes, Tess, that's really terrific. Are, are they going to is it are they going to go to that same physical location to, to meet with people? How's that going to so work? So they've actually been meeting with. Um, we need to figure out the exact logistics and administration of it. This was happening in the chamber location, um, but. There's no reason why we can't be able to do it in the physical location. So, I mean, it'd just be nice if, and it's obviously not essential, but it's nice if it's all there's like a one stop shopping, right? I mean, exactly. All the, all the resources. So, yeah. So, Tom, the hope is that we can utilize the space to also hold workshops through SCORE and through the chamber and this program. But as of right now, the past two years of the program have been virtual. So they've been doing it all on Zoom, but hopefully we get out of we get over that hump eventually, and we're in person again, where we could be able to hold the classes in person. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Great. Let me just go next. So this one is a little bit different than what we've just talked about on the previous slides, and this one is more of a general boost for our urban core. So this is focused on public programming to attract people and business to the businesses um, in 2022 and 2023. And this is something that Sabrina and I have talked for years about. Um, and, you know, we're just really excited. We didn't, we've always talked about including it in a capital budget or an operating budget, um, but this actually is a great opportunity to be able to use ARPA funds to be able to bring on a program manager who's a contract program manager. And that person would be in charge of being able to organize food festivals, arts and cultural festivals, music related festivals and sporting events. Um, and we feel like they're really important because they will be the person who will be dealing with all of the logistics and the administration of organizing the kiosks, organizing the permitting um, process, being able to go through and really host on behalf of the city as a whole events that we're gonna be sponsoring. So again, this isn't a specific loan or a grant. This is more of a blanket approach to being able to really attract people into the urban core, into our downtown core. And when we talk about the urban downtown core, we're talking about Wall Street West to have and also the Sono Washington area. So we also feel like this is a really huge um, opportunity for us to be able to get programming in place, knowing that the Walk Bridge project is coming and that it's been delayed for a number of years. And we know that, but it's something that we've always talked about and really trying to be able to get pedestrians um, and cyclists down through our downtown urban core and being able to establish these programs uh, is a really big piece of that. So it's something we're really excited about. So um, modernization in support of business. Um, so this is, um, this is where I really geek out in the <laughs> thinking about permitting and licensing and technology and all of the slides that we presented and all the programs we presented are all extremely important. Um, this stuff and this particular slide uh, is exciting for me and exciting for our team because it really not only alleviates um, the process for residents and for businesses that want to open in Norwalk, but it also alleviates the time and effort that are spent in each of the departments and being able to coordinate the effort and also doing the research that it takes to be able to get the businesses off the ground. So not only are we um, saving time and money in-house for the city, we're also saving time and money for businesses and residents as well. 
So there's a few different pieces to this. Um, they're all technological based um, solutions that streamline the processes and support of business. And the first, um, the first bullet is talking about business navigation tool and permitting and licensing software. So we're looking to contract with a third party company to be able to do a number of different things. The first thing is that we'd like them to come in and meet with all of the different departments and learn which departments are involved in permitting and licensing, what the current process looks like and help us map that process. The second is um, identifying opportunities for streamlining, which means um, identifying duplicative, uh, duplicative processes or understanding where um, we're looking at a domino effect instead of being able to review applications in parallel to be able to speed up the process. And then looking to implement a one-stop shop um, online solution for residents, business owners, and city departments. So those two pieces really go um, together and I'm happy to answer questions um, about each of them separately if there are any questions. The second is a permit coordinator. This is again, something we've talked about for a number of years. Um, we actually will be including this, this particular position in the operating budget for business development and tourism for this fiscal year, um, beginning July 1st. But we have the ARPA funds to be able to cover the first three years of funding for that particular person. So the thought would be um, that this person would assist businesses and residents through permitting and licensing but they would actually act as the main conduct, contact for um, leading the project management for the software that would support the online permitting and licensing. In addition, um, they would also develop a catalog of business friendly uh, documents to guideline and streamline the process as well. So really looking to be able to um, launch this effort that makes it a lot easier for businesses to be able to open in Norwalk and go through the process and also residential um, permitting and licensing as well. The third is digitizing documentation. <laughs> and again, um, who knew that something so boring could be so incredibly exciting, but <laughs> the, uh, you know, we just, we have five sets of field cards um, that start in 1927, go all the way up until current times and Every day um, we go into the basement of City Hall and we pull boxes and bring them up to building and code enforcement and do research on those field cards. And then when we're done the research, we put the field cards back in the boxes and they go back into the basement. And you know, we do that not only with the field cards, but we also do that with maps and planning and zoning. Um, and we go through a big exercise each year where we catalog everything and we put it in boxes and then we try desperately to find storage space somewhere in the city facility to be able to house all this stuff. Um, so we're looking at digitizing all the field cards and all the maps and planning and zoning and also building and code enforcement. And that's not only to, um, again, save time and money in city hall, but also to save time and money for residents and business owners. So all of these things would be accessible online. They would all be filed in a documentation uh, management system. And if someone's looking for research, um, we can easily send them a link to be able to have access to that particular file um, where they can print it at home and move forward with their application. So just really, um, again, a really exciting effort in the sense of really being able to modernize City Hall to be able to be responsive to business. My only comment is long overdue, Jessica. So <laughs> thank you. And I'm yes. sure that's not the only area within um, the city's process that needs to be modernized. So um, yes. um, hopefully your efforts will, will spark efforts in other departments. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, and I think we've, thank you, Darlene, I appreciate that. And I think um, we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. So we've learned um, many good things and many things that we could use improvement on. So I think uh, we're really excited to move forward with this stuff. Yeah, and I think the pandemic has shown how important this is. Uh, just Absolutely. With, when City Hall was closed, particularly, I mean, this was so critical that, and to get be done. So I'm glad you're doing it, it's great. Great, thank you. So just in summary, um, we're looking at 2.93 million in ARPA funds to support businesses over the next three years. 
Um, we're looking at direct grants and loans to over 165 businesses, of which 36% is committed to the women minority business enterprises. Um, we're looking at direct ongoing support and assistance to hundreds of businesses, and that's through the Business Development Center and also the innovation program that we're talking about, where we're giving them long-term skill sets to be able to move forward. Um, we're looking at indirect ongoing support and assistance um, focused on attracting people into the urban core, and then over $1.2 million in modernization efforts to streamline and adopt technological services and solutions um, to have the city be a little bit more business friendly. So you know, really, really excited um, to work with Sabrina and have Sabrina help lead a number of these efforts. And again, she did a lot of work in being able to shape and support um, the efforts that we talked about today and we're just we're really eager to get started so we wanted to share all of our ideas and thoughts with you one to get feedback but two also to sort of set the stage over the next couple of months of bringing any contracts to you or bringing any um, agreements to you that we need to put into place and we wanted to make sure that we were sharing our thoughts with you in advance so that as these things come up on the agenda you'll have um, information and background as to how they all fit together as a package and how they all work together as a whole. I think that's all. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jessica. Great job. Any questions before we um, close this out? Yeah. Okay, uh, really quick to everyone um, before we uh, call for a motion to adjourn. Uh, how many of you would like hard copies of the agenda sent to your home? Just trying to get a poll and see um, who would like hard copies. <coughs> Ellen? Okay, that makes it easy. Okay, uh, our next meeting will have quite a bit. Um, we're going to have CDBG. We're going to be getting our binders and books. And uh, we'll be starting that meeting at 6 p.m. and be presented by all the applicants. Is that correct, um, Jessica and Sabrina? Yep. Next meeting. That's okay. So if you could make a note that we'll be starting at 6, because I know there are quite a few applicants and that's going to take some time. Also, at our next meeting, we plan to um, get an update with the industrial and waterfront study, Webster Street lot, and, uh, and Jessica and um, Sabrina, and maybe you want to include um, Steve Klepp in this. Be nice. It's been asked of me to uh, have an update on maybe the economic uh, uh, outlook for the city in regards to businesses, businesses that have left, come, or you know, moved, whatever the case may be. Just kind of get an overview of, of what's going on there as far as businesses are um, in Norwalk. That would be great. If, and if we don't have time, I guess we'll discuss this later, Jessica, but if we don't have time, maybe we'll We'll, we'll do that at the uh, March meeting, but uh, if you get to get that on your radar, because I know that's probably going to be a lot of information you have to gather for that. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess so. That's that's the end of the agenda. Uh, the end of the agenda. Uh, thank you all. Uh, be careful tomorrow on the roads. Hopefully you don't have to go too far or, or anywhere at all. Uh, and that being said, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I am thank a beater. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Kelly right. got her hand up first. I got my yes, hand yes. up first. I think your hand's been up the entire meeting. It's great. Yes. <laughs> um, We're waiting for that moment. Waiting for the moment. You're ready to go. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Great, everyone. Be careful. Be safe. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.